This presentation has been prepared to help non-technical decision makers who are bombarded with statistics and reports of complex models. I try to explain the mechanics behind the spreading of the Ebola virus, the ways to interpret the results of models produced, and suggestions for the best use of resources to slow transmission rates. Any analysis of an outbreak starts by looking at the population impacted. It includes individuals who are healthy as well as those who are sick and have passed away. One of the models available is the SEIR model. It distinguishes between four populations, susceptible, exposed, infectious, and removed. The susceptible population has no immunity to the disease and is in an area where it can be exposed to infectious people. The exposed population has been infected, but is not yet infectious. The virus is in an incubation state. The infectious population is the most critical and is the one that can infect the susceptible population. All individuals who have e either recovered or died are considered removed since they can no longer become infected. A more simple model is the SIR model. I have come up with 13 points to take away from this presentation. The first is that there's no epidemic if the size of the infectious population is decreasing. As long as the number of infectious individuals rises with time, we are dealing with an epidemic. The second point, the rate at which people are removed and can no longer become infected goes down if the duration of infection goes up. Ways that the duration of infection can increase are by improper handling of corpses. The bodily fluids of even corpses are infectious and the traditional burial practices lead only to more infections. Also, men who recover have to abstain for nearly seven weeks since their semen remains infectious for that long a period. This leads us to point three. The next few slides deal with the effective reproduction number R. This number translates to the number of people each infected person infects. As this figure shows, if a community has an R of two, within three weeks, the size of the infectious population can increase by a factor of four, given an incubation period of about 11 days, which is what we have for the current Ebola epidemic. On the other hand, if the R value is one, the size of the infectious group remains the same after three weeks. What we want though is an R number below one. This means that the epidemic is on its way out of the community. This slide shows the impact the R value has on the spread of the outbreak. Four cases are presented, two with an initial infectious population of 1,000 and two with an infectious, an initial population of 20. Two R levels are considered, 2.5 and 1.3. What the figures show is that a community with 20 sick individuals and an R value of 2.5 can end up with the same number of infectious people after three months as a community that initially had 1,000 sick individuals and an R value of 1.3. This leads us to point six. If that same community of 20 was able to lower its R value from 2.5 to 1.3, the number of infectious in three months would be 95 instead of 4,800. A significant observation. Even a small outbreak can generate the same number of cases over time if its R value is uncontrolled as a much larger initial outbreak. So how do we lower the effective reproduction number to less than one? 
we need to lower the contact rate and the transmissibility, and if possible, increase immunity. This is done with the separation between the infectious and susceptible populations, frequent hand washing, and the implementation of means to increase immunity. The use of blood serum from recovered individuals is a promising option for building an immune population that's being considered by others. The need to quarantine the infected group and limit the risk of exposure among the susceptible population should be self-evident. Encouraging the cooperation of the community in this effort is where the problem lies. Though lockdowns and curfews offer the benefit of reducing the contact of infe infectious with the greater population, they run the risk of leading people to seek desperate measures if they feel unsupported, can no longer earn an income, and run out of food. But as it is said, you can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and lockdowns will become necessary if the outbreak continues to grow out of control. Introducing a phased approach with limited duration lockdowns can allow the logistics to be improved on incrementally until possibly smooth execution is attained. Point nine addresses the fact that although there are significant benefits to mass immunization on transmission and halting epidemics, research has shown that primary focus should be on limiting the number of new infections. And this can be done with effective control measures introduced to lower the R value. This slide presents a myriad of control measures that are meant to provide the redundancy needed to tackle the rate of infection at all possible levels. Within the infectious population, there needs to be more well-equipped and well-staffed treatment centers, particularly in communities of high infections. There need to be financial incentives, both for families who've lost loved ones and need to be encouraged to hand over corpses and to survivors who are immune and can support as caregivers. The susceptible populations must also have food and water supplies provided while their mobility is restricted, as well as given the means to keep up hand washing with soap and water supplies. The need to support healthcare workers cannot be overemphasized. They are bearing the brunt of the outbreak and must be given the protection and reimbursement that's due. Such a complex program cannot succeed without careful co coordination, planning, and enforcement, which requires many individuals and organizations to work together. Moving on to the situation in Sierra Leone in particular, the current infection rate is decreasing, but is still just below 0.9 meaning that the number of infectious are rising every day. The point should be made that although we appear to have a relatively low death rate based on the published statistics, 45%, those who work with the sick vehemently question this. They feel that the rate is much higher and the scale of the outbreak much wider than the published data suggests. This slide presents an overview of the various conclusions that can be made by looking at the model results. I will start with a disclaimer with four points of note. One, the reliability of these results depends on that of the available data, which may be unconservative. Two, the analysis was executed without the use of sophisticated computer programs that are in use by others. Three, it is not clear how reliable the analysis is using low numbers that are reported at the district level. Three, four, this work is for discussion purposes only. It was developed by a civil engineer, not a mathematician. However, I think we can still garner some useful information. First of all, it is clear comparing the results of the countrywide versus the district results that unless you get down to localized levels, that is village, ward, chiefdom, district, you will miss the hot spots that really need attention. If you look at Sierra Luna as a whole, the R value is 1.22. However, at the district level, you can see that six districts, as well as the Western area, all exceed this value. Secondly, the numbers of individuals actually infectious at any point in time is significantly less than the number of total reported cases. But like has been discussed earlier, even a small number can rise dramatically with time if the R value is high. 
Also shown in this table are the critical vaccination threshold, the proportion of infectious at the peak of the outbreak, and the proportion of the population that will ultimately be infected if the R values are not to change. In the SIR model, each of these parameters is impacted only by the R value. For instance, in Connaught District, where the R value is 1.78, although there may only be 10 individuals infectious at this time, by the end of the epidemic, nearly 73% of the impacted population would be infected, and it would take immunizing 43% of the susceptible population to control the outbreak. The remaining slides present the equations and assumptions used in the SIR model. And in conclusion, I will reiterate the purpose of developing models for epidemics. They allow us to quantify how fast the outbreak is spreading, what the relative severity is in various locations, what the forecast is for a week, a month, or several months ahead if there's no improvement in control, and allows us to check whether control measures are working. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you for your attention.